But tonight's top story, the rape trial in Concord, New Hampshire. The jury has gone home for the day after hearing closing arguments. They heard two starkly contrasting versions of what happened between a 17-year-old male student and a 15-year-old female student at St. Paul's School. The defendant, Owen Labrie, is now 19. He faces six charges of sexual assault. Here is how the prosecution and defense summed up the events on the night of the alleged crime. On May 30th, 2014, the defendant had a plan. It was thought out. It was calculated. He brought a blanket. He brought a condom. He knew who he wanted to bring there. He knew why he wanted to bring there. And he knew what he wanted to do once he got them there. And on the last night before graduation, nothing, not even a girl saying no and holding on to her underwear was going to stop him. Members of the jury, it's not about that Owen had excellent academics or was a terrific athlete. I'm not saying he is a saint. He's not a saint. He's a teenager. But I submit he told you the truth from that stand. And my guest is NECN legal analyst Michael Coyne, the dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Michael, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Joe. You heard the closing arguments today. Give me your impression. Give us your impression, first of all, of how that went. Any way you feel the case is leaning right now? Uh, I think the case is leaning uh, to the defendant's favor. Really? I think uh, Mr. Carney has done a, a very good job summing up the evidence that supports the grounds for reasonable doubt. And I think that really is the key as you take a step back and think about the case is that the government in our system has a very heavy burden of proof to remove doubt, remove all reasonable doubt. And uh, with the conflicting text messages and the Facebook messages, some of the conflicting physical evidence, I think the government has a very difficult burden in this case, removing all reasonable doubt. But regardless of what happens here in the verdict, I think this case has brought up a lot of very troubling, disturbing questions. First of of all, for St. Paul School, a very, very prestigious school up there in New Hampshire. I think John Kerry went there, a lot of distinguished alumni, secretaries of state, ambassadors. Is St. Paul to blame for this culture uh, of, of what, we, what we're seeing now? I, I think there's no doubt that Mr. Carney has done a good job putting the campus culture of St. Paul's on trial and allowing the jury to be able to think is that if there is someone other than the defendant to blame, then it very well may be St. Paul's. And, and in fact, an institution, any institution, but especially an ed educational institution that that is uh, to serve young people, uh, has a responsibility that when we as parents bring them our children to make sure they keep them safe. A and so there is a legitimate question whether St. Paul's, the, the culture that's on campus, has helped to contribute to, to this case and potentially the, the young woman's injuries if, in fact, um, the defendant did what she claims he did. And I think some of this has been shocking. In this day and age, you know, they're calling it a slain of, of like getting a girl into bed. These are freshman girls, a slain. And this uh, suspect, the uh, defendant, kept a list saying the victim was, quote, still at large, still mm. at large. That, that's disgusting. And people can't believe this is still going on. Well, teenage boys talk in a very crude and rough fashion, and I think uh, there's well, also a lot know, of... He's a senior. He's uh, not uh, just a little kid. I, I don't disagree, but, mm -hmm. but to some extent, a lot of it is the bravado that, that maybe the culture on campus helps to instill in them and the like. I think you have to take a step back from some of the language that they use as they talk to one another and really try to take a look at the case and decide whether the case warrants the, the rape uh, charges that took place and ultimately the conviction and that's the key it's not necessarily the language they use although the language is distasteful I'm sure he, yeah. he and his mother were both embarrassed by it when they heard well, they it should be. Yeah, I, I don't disagree really, it's terrible I, I mean, don't disagree if he was yeah. my, if they were these were my children I would yeah. be very disappointed that my boys are using language like that and especially being as disrespectful as they were to to the young women on campus this case really may not have even been prosecuted in other states right because New Hampshire is is in the minority here, they don't require force in order to convict someone uh, of underage rape, correct? With respect to uh, the crime that's commonly called statutory mm -hmm. rape, mo many states feel that if the 
the victim is under a certain age, even if she was a willing victim, that there can be no consent under the circumstances. New Hampshire has an interesting statute in all of New Hampshire's crimes for with respect to um, rape along the lines of this are called sexual assault. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire has an interesting provision that says even though she was under the age of 16 and couldn't consent because he was no more than four years older than her, if she in fact consented to this sexual intercourse, then it would only be a misdemeanor in New Hampshire and that may be uh, what the jury will ultimately look at as well. And I think a lot of victims advocates are upset that a lot of states still have this force rule in effect, which is kind of an old fashioned notion of rape, isn't it, in, to in today's society, that there has to be force? Not, not necessarily, because um, as a general matter, that what you're looking at with respect to rape is non-consensual mm -hmm. sex. So whether it takes place by threat of force or force itself, either way it could still classify as rape in most jurisdictions. Here the key is that because she's a minor, was unable to legally consent uh, to the sexual exchange. So your prediction will be a not guilty verdict that Labrie will get off. Uh, do you anything you saw in the trial to indicate you know the how the victim has done on the stand? I think the victim gave a very powerful and convincing testimony with respect to her perspective. Mm -hmm. I think clearly she was has been hurt by this whole process um, and the legal process as well. We we are very brutal with respect yeah. to the manner in which we treat victims who come forward with such allegations. The the problem with it is is that the burden of proof is so heavy on the government mm -hmm. that all they have to do as the defendant is to create some level of right. reasonable doubt. Nine men, three mm -hmm. women. I do wonder whether it'll be partly split along gender lines as mm -hmm. well. I do not see a conviction on all of the charges. I think the jury at the end of the day uh, is likely to bring back a not guilty. They could compromise potentially on the misdemeanor uh, sexual assault charge. Well, we will find out soon. Michael Coyne, thank you very much uh, for giving, you, giving us this analysis. Thanks, Appreciate Joe. Appreciate it.